I am really looking forward to this, this workshop. David Franklin is a longtime colleague and friend. He's the one who gave me this hat, Gawk and Ponder. Uh, I call it uh, Franklinisms. He's full of them. You will hear a bunch of them today. Um, and uh, so uh, probably the title of this workshop drew you to this class. And I really, you know, I've known David for a long time. I have no way, uh, I, I have no idea where he's going with us, but uh, I'm sure we will find out here right now. So uh, David, why don't you tell a little bit, uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, what you've been doing lately, then the hour is all yours. Well, uh, not, well, I, one thing I wanted to say was um, the the presentation I put together is kind of um, uh, and you know informative in the historical and semi antidotal context. It's not it's not like a research paper of hard data and but it's more. Um, trying to frame how did we get here into the world of stormwater and a little bit about the backstory. And so I called it national nightmares. And, you know, that, that image there on the screen, I guess, is from some little cove off the San Francisco Bay in the East Bay of California. And because uh, the, the trash wash just gets pushed by the tide and, so let's see what I have in this presentation and if it all comes out as far as I'm looking out the window and I see a an oil barge coming up the river. There's an oil barge winding down the Cuyahoga River rolling into Cleveland to the lake. There's an oil barge winding down the Cuyahoga River Rolling into Cleveland to the lake Cleveland, city of light City of magic Cleveland, city of light You're calling me Cleveland, even now I can remember Cause the Cuyahoga River Goes smoking through my dreams Burn on, big river Burn on Burn on, big river Burn on Now the Lord can make you tumble The Lord can make you turn The Lord can make you overflow But the Lord can make you burn Burn on, big river Burn on Burn on Big river burn on. Wow. So I'm always amazed that we used to have burning rivers in the country for decades. Apparently, this Cuyahoga River caught on fire 13 times and uh, over a hundred year period. And, uh, you know, oil spills and so forth. But uh, this, the Clean Water Act of 72 was, was because of a fire from 69. And this fire is from 1952. So what was the fire in 1969? It was not a very big fire. Apparently, they didn't take pictures until the next day. It was just a small fire. In fact, the fire marshal at the time was quoted as saying, it's just a regular fire. Move along. No need to pass a Clean Water Act or anything. And 
at the time, the state laws told local people to allow the state to prosecute the polluters. But they might not have always done that. So now when the Clean Water Act was passed, it says that a violation of a local ordinance is a violation of the Clean Water Act. So it gave some power to the local people in numerous ways. Initially, they went after the regulated, they regulated facilities that like sanitary sewer districts and fat, fat industrial facilities. And, and they were given numeric standards for their wastewater discharges. But for 15 years from 72 to 87, they did the National Urban Runoff Program studies where they studied all the raindrops hitting the dirty cities. So while agriculture across the U.S. is a big source of sediment in the water bodies, our cities tend to be on the coasts or near the water bodies like in Chicago and so big populations by the big water bodies and the raindrops hit the dirty cities. And so the EPA said, we cannot have a numeric standard because it's not wastewater from a facility. It's raindrops running off a road. So they said compliance is through best management practices, which are imperfect. But we have to have knowledgeable people to design, specify, install, inspect, maintain, which is different than repairing, and remove. Remove the BMPs that are imperfect, our avenue to compliance for stormwater, which is not wastewater, even though we get a wastewater permit. So who was singing that song? And it's okay to say the Toy Story guy. You've got a friend in me. But Randy Newman wrote the song we just heard because of the fire that resulted in the EPA and the Clean Water Act. Randy Newman wrote a song about that fire from 79. And he's written many other amazing songs that include the environment also. Like, look up his song, Louisiana, about the floods down in Louisiana 100 years ago. So the song, the EPA, the Clean Water Act, brought us here today for Stormwater Awareness Week. And so what was the pollutant of that fire? Well, it was trash, apparently, on the water body. The sparks from the train ignited the trash, and the trash ignited the bridge. But we have other kinds of historical challenges. This idea of the dead zones. It's just an idea generated by AI. No, not really. It's a real thing, dead zones. And uh, lots of dead fish. So there's the Mississippi watershed. And look how huge it is. Whatever comes off our jobs, our, our stormwater discharges, in the Midwest, it's going there. And so we've got this watershed going to the Pacific, to the Gulf, to the Atlantic. And up here, there's a watershed that goes to Newfoundland. And right here, there's a little watershed that goes to Hudson Bay and the Arctic Circle. But for the Mississippi watershed, we've got this idea of a, a dead zone that's still out there where aquatic life can't live. And it's not the only dead zone. They say this dead zone is the size of the state of Massachusetts. So in the 1960s, it was said that the whole of Lake Erie was dead. And Lake Erie is the shallowest and warmest of the five great lakes. And the basin around Lake Erie is uh, intensely developed with agriculture and urban runoff. 
industries, and sewage plants. And for decades, pollution filled Lake Erie with far more nutrients than it could handle. And phosphorus was the main culprit. But the demise of Lake Erie even made it into a book by Dr. Zeus, The Lorax. And to quote the book, as they were departing, the Lorax said, Oh, their future is dreary. I hear things are just as bad up in Lake Erie. Referencing the appalling condition of the lake. But you know, that reference in the Lorax was removed years later after two uh, researchers advised Seuss that the cleanup of the lake was well underway. Now, uh, in Chesapeake Bay, they say that 40% of the bay is dead at the peak of summer, just struggling to stay alive because it's a shallow bay. And in the heat of summer, it, it declines, I guess, seasonally. And you can see the difference right there. More clear water and, and less clear water. So seasonal adjustments uh, impact the uh, viability of aquatic life. Globally, they say that the dead zones are doubling each decade. And so what is a dead zone? Well, they, they have this word eutrophication, the excess uh, nutrients hitting the water body, as coming as runoff from the land, agricultural nutrients, which causes, you know, algae blooms and plant life in the water body, which after it peaks out, it has a big collapse in the water body. And so all that collapsing lush aquatic vegetation uh, starts to decompose, which sucks the oxygen out of the water. But this, uh, this timeline here is for the US and it shows a, a peak and a decline which is different than the previous slide, which said that globally it's increasing every decade. But maybe this is showing us that it's not so bad in the United States. Uh, at least it's not as bad as it used to be. And that's slime from sewage in the Potomac River. So the Potomac River, I think it's on Chesapeake Bay, right? And uh, it was one of the first wastewater dischargers uh, brought into regulation when the Clean Water Act was passed. Now, even though Rich, Richard Nixon uh, vetoed the bill, he was overruled by Congress and it became law. But at least he did assign a real bulldog as the first head in the EPA. And that person made great examples of industry and helped you know, bring funding to the corrections that was needed. So Chesapeake Bay was targeted with federal support. They spent a billion dollars and they even invented biological nutrient removal where you've got those ponds offline up on the flatlands above the river digesting the sewage. Nevertheless, accidents still happen and raw sewage gets discharged frequently, even today, due to things like big back-to-back -back storms or growing urban areas that the infrastructure at the sewage plant hasn't been upgraded to handle. So in the chat box, if you know where this image is from, you could chat it over and I think Rebecca will let you out 15 seconds early today if you know the answer. But where is this image from? Anybody know? Oh, here's a chat. Let's see what the chat box says. Oh, it's a general welcome. So this image here is from Lake Superior. 
And on March 16th, 1980, Reserve Mining Company stopped dumping 67,000 tons a day, which is 47 tons per minute. They stopped in 1980. Taconite tailings. Taconite is a rock that they learned how to remove the iron from. And you know, the great iron range in Minnesota is famous for providing iron. But the taconite byproduct, the tailings, was being dumped into Lake Superior. And this uh, mining company was the first taconite processing facility in the North America. And they were dumping the tailings into the world's largest freshwater body, starting in 1956. And they stopped in 1980. Now, at the time, the competition was dumping their sediment onto land and building mountains, which is what the owners of dams do. Owners of dams, they have to remove the sediment and they build mountains with the sediment. They don't go and dump it in another water body. So for nearly 25 years, the equivalent of a railroad car of sediment every two minutes was being dumped into Lake Superior. Even though others were doing it to land. So there were allegations that the fishing industry was being severely impacted the lake trout, all the fishermen were saying, it's not like it used to be, declined. And it looks like that's a city in the background there on the land that was built to support the operations in Silver Bay, Minnesota. So there's the lake trout. And I know some people don't like pictures of dead fish, so I apologize after the fact. But that's from Lake LaCroix last month. 1973, Judge Miles Lord and federal attorney John Hills viewed the on-land disposal of taconite tailings at Hoyt Lakes, a method that reserve mining said was not practical, but others were doing it. So a stream like this was going into the Lake Superior for almost 25 years. But it took 11 years, 1969 was when the injunction was passed, the first enforcement action. And it took 11 years for the appeal process to be overruled. And in 1980, they had to stop. But disposing of tailings on lands requires management of air pollution. So that's why they keep it as a liquid slurry. So what pollutant was coming off of this, you know, they got sediment, of course, but they also had allegations that there were asbestos-like fibers in the sediment. And they associated that with the impacting the fish, but also the drinking water further down the lake shoreline in Duluth, where they had to use advanced filtering for the drinking water in Duluth under the threat of these asbestos-like fibers. Cattle. So this is not Bakersfield. Where is it? Why are cattle a problem? And when were they a problem for a water body? Well, starting in the 1800s, they started bringing cattle to the shores of the Mississippi. Cattle yard. They had stockyards on the shore of the Mississippi, the banks. And so Armour and Company was five miles south of St. Paul, Minnesota. St. Paul hosted the largest livestock operation in the world on the Mississippi River. They had 4,000 people processing the animals, 2,000 animals per hour. And where do you think all the blood and guts and wastewater went? Went to 
the mighty Mississippi. And so the biologists did a survey at one point. I think it was like 100 years ago. And, and guess how many, and this is another chance to get out 15 seconds early if you got the answer in the chat box. How many fish do you think they found in the 60 miles south of St. Paul? And if we get some submittals in the chat box, I can use my poorly implemented uh, auctioneer's voice. Zero. John, <laughs> looking for a zero. I need a one. I'm going to find a one, one. We're going to do one, one, one. We're going to do one. Yeah, it was three. Okay. They found three fish in the 60 miles south of St. Paul. That's that's kind of an indicator, I'm thinking. Three fish. So what are the pollutants associated with the cattle yards? Well, you know, they say that manure has like 150 pathogens. Blood and urine contain forms of nitrogen. And the CAFOs, the confined animal feed operations and processing facilities are now, whenever possible, kept far away from the water bodies. You know, like Bakersfield, we got the big facilities there for beef. And some people say the EPA is not really keeping an eye on these kind of operations. I don't know how much they are or are not. But I know that St. Paul does not have cattle yards today. They just have two big pillars at the entry gates to the historic processing plant. Forever chemicals used in Teflon for waterproofing and even on your fast food wrappers in your makeup and upholstery. They say that the forever chemicals, well, they last forever, kind of. And it is something that our stormwater industry across the land is focusing on. I just checked with a uh, laboratory in Duluth to see if they were doing testing for PFOS, and they said they just started. I was thinking about having my well checked, but we'll see about that. But... This facility, which is, I guess, a, a subsidiary of DuPont, Comores, they, at the Grace Creek facility, even though their sister facility in the north was using advanced filtration system, this facility was dumping the bad stuff into the water body and even into the air. So this little outline here is where the air deposition occurred on the land of the forever chemicals. And it migrated to people's wells, 7,000 wells over 800 square miles. One well alone was found to have 16 chemicals in it deposited by air. And then downstream, on the way to the Atlantic, the different the municipal water facilities and so forth for drinking water were impacted. And so uh, it was only after extensive legal action that Comores agreed to get the advanced filtering going and to be providing many people with drinking water every week bottled so they say they never break down accumulate in our bodies and are linked to cancer and birth defects thousands hundreds of thousands were affected so that's still out there today as an impact Well, wow. so Three Mile Island, of course, is the nuclear facility, but I brought it into the presentation for a reason. It's kind of interesting that it constructed from 68 to 78, and it was uh, 
March 78th at the China Syndrome, a movie with this uh, imaginary partial meltdown of a nuclear facility. I think it was in Los Angeles. So it was all fictional, but it came out March 78, just as this came online. And guess what happened in March 78? Three Mile Island had a partial meltdown, just like in the movie, you know, more or less. And at the time, the staff running it didn't realize what was happening, and they took a series of wrong actions. And uh, trace amounts of radioactive gases were escaping, and the alarm was at least partially sounded by the public who had armed themselves with monitoring devices. And that's why I put the slide in to the presentation is that uh, once again, public involve involvement is, uh, is kind of uh, what we get to do and what we kind of have to do, be vigilant and participate in the, uh, the solutions. So they, uh, they brought attention because of their readings. So we've been talking about national water bodies, the Cuyahoga River, the Mississippi, Gulf of Mexico, Lake Erie, Chesapeake, Lake Superior, and Gray's Creek. Oh, and there's that creek that you drive over every day that has a sign saying its name, and you know the name, right? Well, maybe on your next road trip, you'll, you'll remember the name the name of that little creek, the creek that leads to the bigger water body. So national nightmares can be on the water, the land, or the air. But you know what the one of the top fellows at the EPA said when I was reviewing various videos on this topic? He pointed out which oh, was something that a lot of us are aware of, which is those big point source, meaning wastewater violations, are fewer and more isolated than years ago. Yes, they still occur. But the really big current impact is stormwater cumulatively across the land, the way that we design, build, and maintain the way that we live every day. And so, yes, John, I I, I took the uh, sort of antidotal discussion of national nightmares to uh, real things in our backyard. Because what good is a national nightmare discussion if, if we don't get our hands on the situation personally and do what we can? And so there we are, a real job with real issues going to real water bodies. We like to talk about the activity or the material slash waste. I like to talk about the weather. I like to talk about the, the, the pollutant that's related to the activity and also the, the practice that helps. And normally we talk about stormwater as the means of pollutant moving. Sometimes it's the air. Sometimes it's non-storm water. And that's what we're looking at here, a non-storm water condition. So when, when there's supposed to be a, this saw cutting activity, what's, what's the practice? What's the pollutant? And, you know... The saw cutter likes to have water to keep their blade cool, but OSHA likes to have water to keep the dust down. The 2018 silica rule says, stop breathing that hideous dust. Use wet methods. So now we got non-storm water running away from the saw. And there's a drain in it right here. So the practice, if we were to look in a manual, would say, let's have a vacuum at the ready. We cannot avoid generating water. We have to prohibit it from reaching the drain inlet. 
And you know, speaking of drain inlets, when I called the city and said, we have some problems out here in the great state of Minnesota, the land of 15,000 lakes over an acre in size, the person answered the phone. I said, there's a problem. There's runaway slurry. And she said, they should have their drain inlet protections there. And I said, sediment controls do not work for high pH liquid. And she said, you're right. So when we write a stormwater plan, the real goal is to make up for where the project specifications fell short in incorporating environmental protection in the order of work, in the scope of work. We've seen for decades now, Caltrans and so many other entities incorporate environmental protection in their contractor's specs. And the more specific we can be in those specs, the better. But nevertheless, the SWIP has to make up where the generic specs don't cover. So while a BMP manual might say, vacuum the slurry, we might also have to say, don't let the public park in the area. We might have to say, don't let the crew drive through the wet, vacuumed, don't let them track it. We might have to say, switch out the drain and the protections. We're not going to saw cut when it's raining. So therefore, we get to block the drain inlet. We get to block the, we must drop, we have to, we specify switching out the drain and the protection with a rubber mat and sandbags that won't get driven over. They hold the mat down and the sandbags will not get driven over because the crew is trained not to drive over sandbags or through the wet spill, the controlled spill from the saw cutting. And the public won't drive over the sandbags because they don't get to be there. They're excluded. And so some of this is in the BMP manual, like a vacuum. But some of it you've never heard of before. Exclude the public. Switch out the drain protection based on the weather and when saw cutting starts. And when the weekend comes and nobody saw cutting, you open it up again. But did you know, this looks like a controlled spill to me in the middle top picture. Is it good enough just to vacuum it? When the raindrop heavy storm hits, is that going to be a lot cleaner afterwards? So what's the level of effort that we make? And when do we stop and say, that's enough? If you spill something on the ground, you don't just clean up the surface liquid and let the contaminated soil remain. You remove the contaminated soil. So if you spill this saw cutting slurry and vacuum it up, do you get to leave the stain there? Or should you be washing it down? Because the rain will be bringing it to the drain inlet on the weekend. And 50 feet from this drain inlet, there's a lake. And you're going fishing with your 10-year-old to catch the bluegills and fry them up. Well, you might not be catching them on a hook. You might be collecting them off the surface of the water. It's a short-term dead zone. Aquatic life doesn't like high pH storm water. Metals, pH, sediment. The Port of San Diego, the scope of work. Replace the concrete piers over the harbor. You know when they did the concrete pour over the harbor? When it was raining. Why? That's when the trucks were available from the batch plant. Nobody else wanted the concrete trucks when it was raining. 
How about if we do the pour over the San Diego Harbor? Sounds like a mistake to me. How are you going to control the runoff? So there is a BMP called Demolition Over Water because they had to demo the old concrete piers. And there's another BMP called Working Over Water. It talks about catchments. If there's high tide, if there's a permanent high water mark, you could have a barge under there during demo. You could have tarps. You know, Caltrans on the Richmond Bridge over an 18-year period, they went from, in the olden days, sandblasting the lead-based paint right into the bay to a complete catchment system with shrouds and tarps. So the level of effort how do we know when to stop? We have to always ask that question. Coordinating the weather with the construction and the practice. It was kind of a national disaster, if you ask me, the pouring of the concrete piers over the San Diego Harbor. Well, what's this? That's a municipal ditch. The river, the White River. So this is standard operating procedure for some places. And you're going fishing this weekend to catch the bluegills just down, down the street. So maybe this is a staged photo. It looks like they have paintbrushes and uh, antifreeze. I mean, does anybody paint antifreeze anywhere? Or maybe it's the wrong liquid I'm looking at, but I snagged this off the internet. And so the idea is we have to turn our national nightmares into. Hey, hey, into some uh, sweet dreams, right? Let's turn the national nightmares into sweet dreams. So I had this idea to. Uh, Look at three different post-construction conditions for stormwater management while we listen to the other song about the Cuyahoga by R.E.M. Let's see if I can do this properly. So I put those three amazing scenarios, the olden days where they got something going on, but I described a bunch of perspective that came to me. And I took this picture in the 2000s and I had a guy in class years ago. He said, that's my job. And I said, yeah, it's pretty cool. No mow grass. Sheet flow throughout. No fertilizer needed. Low maintenance. But this is an actual job today. Look, I took the picture a few days ago. A new road project. All the pollutants are going to the river. Once that road gets paved, the pollutants forever are going straight to the river. They could have had a bioretention area here that could then discharge to the rocks, to the river. So we got to get the message out. And that's what we're doing. Stormwater Awareness Week, getting the message out. And John? That's it. It's a little bit short, but we can talk about some of those slides if anybody has something to contribute. Well, you never disappoint, David. I can tell you that. <laughs> I, I love your presentations and uh, um, they're so true. So true. Yeah. You have a way of putting it. Um, we, uh, 
sometimes you wonder if we've learned our national lessons. Uh, we start start showing some progress in some areas, and then and then we see things like you just showed us. Well, on that last image, you know, I uh, I reached out to the public uh, works department, and uh, it's in another state than California, but um, I'm I, I'm going to work hopefully with the public works because it's a huge municipality. They must have C three requirements uh, nationwide that they're supposed to follow. And so uh, we'll see if we can kind of shift the paradigm uh, little by little, right? Right, right. And that, and that's what it's about. It's about awareness, as you said. It's, a, it's about getting the education into those who make the decisions, who draw the designs, who, who calculate the calculations, who are, are holding the purse strings so that they understand collectively what we're trying to accomplish. And the only way we can make that happen is through awareness. And I always like the, the perspective that who's going to pay when? Are we going to spend huge amounts to be cleaning up rivers when we could put the money into the design to not let it get polluted in the first place? Right. Right. Planning for the future. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's all I have. And happy to uh, hear from others who have something to contribute. Yeah. We have Otherwise, some time, so we'll open it up if you uh, would like to even unmute. And uh, uh, maybe you have your own uh, calamity testimony or or your um, your success story. We'd love to hear from you. So anybody want, have anything to you want to add to this discussion? We'd love to. And there's a, how you can get a hold of David Franklin. And uh, he actually uh, uh, is probably the most prolific trainer in California for QSP, QSDs. So uh, if you're looking for that kind of training or QISPs. I know for a lot of you in the country, those acronyms don't mean a thing. But here in California, they're pretty important. So if you're um, interested in that, <laughs> you can contact them. So John, every Friday morning, I hang out on a Zoom link and as we call it Open Forum Friday. And we have people come in and uh, talk about all kinds of things, storm water, pollution prevention. And you know, sometimes it's nobody, sometimes it's one or two people, but I try to be there every week. Yeah. In fact, three years ago, I think we did that for a stormwater awareness uh, week uh, presentation. Yeah. All right. Well, I know it's Friday afternoon and uh, we, we told them if they answered some questions, uh, we'd let them out 15 seconds early. So maybe we'll go ahead and do that. Um, but uh, if you want to get a hold of David, there's his contact information. And again, thank you for attending this stormwater awareness week. Uh, uh, workshop, but also the whole week. It's been a blast. And just to recap some of the uh, things that we've seen this week, uh, our, our numbers, what we were seeing, Rebecca, uh, do you want to unmute and tell people where where we're at, what we saw this week? Yeah, She's absolutely. Rebecca. By the way, Rebecca Burnett is our is our main coordinator. So if you enjoyed this week, a lot of that goes to her credit. She's the one who, who's the brains and the, and, and the, she gets the job done. Yeah, thank you. And I just sent out an email. So you probably all will be getting this soon in your inbox with some of the stats from the event. But this week we saw 10,813 registrations, which equates to about 2,500 and 20 individuals because we have some people that attend one and some people that attend all. So we like to track both. Uh, we had 48 workshops over the course of a week. 49 states um, were represented. We had attendees from 49 states. We were just missing someone from North Dakota. So if you attended and you live in North Dakota, let us know. Because yeah, put it in your know. chat. That's the one state we're missing. And we also had 23 countries represented. And right now, people have been watching all of the workshops that are recorded and on our website. And we have 
2,215 video views. So those are going up. Be sure to check out any of the ones that you might have missed. But it's been a great week, and thank you, everyone, for participating. And if you haven't seen the Yosemite keynotes, I would highly recommend those. It's a video series we shot a couple of years ago. Um, in fact, if you want to share that with your family this weekend, it, I think you'll enjoy it. it. It's of uh, general interest and a great way to kind of see Yosemite and a lot of the topics that David was talking about today. So, um, all right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, always a pleasure. And uh, we'll see you all next year. Stormwater Awareness Week 2025. Trying to make rain. Trying to make rain. All right. Make rain. See y'all.